Hello Chem 1. Today in 12.2 we're going to take a closer look at liquids and the properties we can measure about them. Let's get started. In Unit 11 we already talked about the kinetic molecular theory and how that impacts our understanding of gases. We can also use the kinetic molecular theory to understand liquids a little better. In every substance, solid, liquid, or gas, we have molecules, and how those molecules interact with one another can give us insight into why they're in the current state they're in at a certain temperature and at a certain pressure. So for instance, if the intermolecular forces are very strong, typically those particles will tend to organize and create solids. If they're very weak, they'll tend to be gases because they aren't attracted to each other with very much strength. And then liquids will be somewhere in the middle depending on the strength of those intermolecular forces. Let's take a look at some properties of liquids. First of all, a liquid is defined as something that has a definite volume but does not have a definite shape. The intermolecular forces of a liquid are somewhere in that medium range where the particles of a liquid have the ability to slide past one another, allowing them to flow. A liquid will also always have one free or exposed surface. One measurement that we've already used in this class that we can measure about liquids is density. Density is just a proportion of mass to volume. The more dense a liquid is, the more mass it has in a smaller volume. Liquids typically are less dense than a solid, which makes sense because the molecules should be more spread out. But there are examples like water that are actually less dense in the liquid phase. This is because when water crystallizes, the crystal takes up more space than its liquid counterpart. Another property of liquids that it shares with solids is the inability to be compressed. We cannot compress a liquid because there's not as much empty space. In a gas, much of the gas is empty space, therefore it can be compressed. Solids and liquids, not so much. Remember, solids and liquids have definite volumes. They cannot be compressed. A property that liquids share with gases would be the ability to flow or fluidity. Liquids and gases have weaker intermolecular forces which allows particles or molecules to slide past one another. The weaker the intermolecular forces, the more fluid that a liquid would be. And the more fluid a liquid would be would play into our next measurement, which is viscosity. Viscosity is the resistance to flow. So if something is liquid but doesn't flow easily, think like honey or syrup or molasses, then it would be considered viscous. Typically that's because it has stronger intermolecular forces and therefore it's resistant to flow or it has less fluidity. Viscosity can be manipulated. If we heat up the molecules or particles within a viscous liquid, that will make them move around more and disrupt the intermolecular forces that are holding them together and that will allow it to flow. You've experienced this. This is why you would microwave honey so that it would pour easier out of its container. Here's kind of a chart that shows the viscosity of different fluids. Water is not viscous at all. It flows very easily. Where chocolate syrup or heavy syrup, they're very viscous, they resist flow, and therefore they have stronger intermolecular forces. The next property we'll talk about here is volatility. Volatility is how easy a liquid evaporates. Once again, this comes back to intermolecular forces. If the intermolecular forces of a liquid are very strong, it's going to take a long time to evaporate. Because they're attracted to each other with great strength, it's going to take more time for them to separate and evaporate into an atmosphere. The opposite is also true. If something has weak intermolecular forces, it'll evaporate very quickly. A lot of times, things with weak intermolecular forces, you smell them very quickly because they evaporate quickly. So for instance, a lot of times we'll dissolve perfume or scents into alcohol. This is because alcohol evaporates really quickly and you want perfume to dissipate quickly so people smell it. Other things that have weak intermolecular forces are like gasoline, kerosene, and other fuels and they vaporize quickly, which can be bad and dangerous, but it's also a key component to the combustion engine. You need gasoline in the vapor or gas form so that it'll burn. This is why we call gasoline a volatile liquid. It's not because it's explosive, it's because it evaporates very readily because of its weak intermolecular forces. Liquid's ability to evaporate quickly goes with our next measurement, which is vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is the pressure over a surface of a liquid. In order for something to evaporate, the pressure that the liquid is pushing up on the atmosphere with has to be greater than the atmospheric pressure. So if you think about it, there's really two forces on the surface of a liquid. There's the atmosphere pressure that's pushing down, but there's also a vapor pressure inside of this liquid pushing in all directions. So if the upward push of that vapor pressure 
overcomes or is greater than the atmospheric pressure, then it will evaporate or boil. So the act of a liquid boiling is actually heating up the inside of a liquid so that those molecules have enough push, enough force, enough pressure that it overcomes the atmospheric pressure that's pushing down on top of it. You can see this here in the second drawing. With no heat, the vapor pressure isn't greater than the external pressure. But as we add heat, bubbles start to form in the liquid because the vapor pressure is starting to increase, overcome the downward push of the atmospheric pressure, and those are the bubbles you see when a liquid is boiling. It's literally the liquid going to the gas phase and overcoming the downward push of the atmosphere. If a liquid has a high vapor pressure or if it wants to push in all directions with great strength, that typically means it has weak intermolecular forces. If they're not being held together with strength, that means they're going to push outward in all directions with greater force. And this vapor pressure is what affects boiling point. Typically speaking, the higher the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. Because if molecules or particles are attracted to each other, we're gonna have to add more heat to them so that they will separate, so that they will push outward with a great vapor pressure and therefore boil. So the higher the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. If it has weak intermolecular forces, they're already naturally gonna produce a greater vapor pressure and push outward, and we won't need to add as much heat to get them to boil. Intermolecular forces also affect surface tension. Surface tension is the inward pull of like particles or like molecules within a liquid. If a liquid has strong intermolecular forces, it typically is gonna have lots of surface tension or strong surface tension. Water is actually a good example of this. Water has hydrogen bonding, which is one of the strongest intermolecular forces, and therefore water has good surface tension because those molecules are attracted to one another. There are substances that are called surfactants that can disrupt the surface tension and get in between those polar molecules. Dish soap is an example of this. Dish soap regularly disrupts the surface tension of water. Another thing you can see down here in this drawing is that mercury has great intermolecular forces and therefore a great surface tension. That's why mercury will like bead up on the top of a surface because of its very strong intermolecular forces and a very strong surface tension. Where something like acetone, it's nonpolar and has very weak intermolecular forces and therefore it does not beat up. It lays pretty flat because two acetone molecules aren't really attracted to each other with great strength. The last property of a liquid we wanna talk about here is called capillary action. This is the ability of a liquid to flow up narrow spaces. If the intermolecular forces are strong enough, it'll even oppose other forces like gravity. So with capillary action, we have adhesion and cohesion. Adhesion is the force of attraction between non-similar particles, so like water on the side of a beaker or glass. And then cohesion is the force of attraction between similar molecules, so water attracted to water. So you could think of surface tension as a type of cohesion. It's water molecules being attracted to other water molecules. Capillary action typically occurs when adhesion forces are greater than cohesive forces. What this typically means is, is that the molecules are gonna be attracted to the surface more than they're attracted to like molecules. What this does is it gives the ability of these molecules or particles to adhere and move their way up the side of a surface even if it's against the gravity or the level of liquid that it's in. We call this capillary action. Typically speaking, the more narrow the tube is, the further up the water will climb in the tube. Another interesting fact is if you have cohesive properties that are greater than adhesive properties, it will actually do the opposite, and it'll be so attracted to itself that it'll give you a reverse meniscus and actually curve upward. This is because, for instance, like mercury has such strong intermolecular forces, and it's so attracted to other like particles that it'll actually invert the meniscus. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of some of the properties we can measure about liquids. Make sure you complete the activity for this section. Keep up the good work. We'll see you soon.